Entrepreneurship is seeing problems as opportunities. Whenever I look at ideas of entrepreneurship and social enterprise, I always start with the problems. What needs to be solved? To be able to start with the problems, we need to know how to look for and see the opportunities within the problems. So the first step in finding a problem is finding the right point of view. In cases where we're hoping to make a business or social enterprise to solve a problem, we are trying to find the ideal customer point of view. This point of view can be easy to find if you start with the problems that you and your community have. It's always easier when we're trying to solve our own problems, but we want to make sure that these are problems that multiple people in the community have. If it's just your problem that you're solving, that's great, but it's hard to sell. If you're solving the problem that a whole community has, that's better. Talking with people from your ideal customer group can help you better understand what the problems are and how they've tried to solve them in the past. There's often a lot of information hidden in people's complaints and asking them to clarify themselves when they're complaining about a problem can help you get to the core of their problems. In these conversations, try to understand if the complaints are actually issues that they'd be willing to pay to have solved or if they're just minor annoyances that they can live with. Once you have your initial list of potential problems to look at solving, you can go and listen in other wider settings to see if this is a generalized problem that others also have. If you're looking at solving a problem that exists across communities, then it's more likely to be able to scale to become a viable business. It's also possible that multiple groups might accept a similar solution to that problem. This listening can take place by watching for topics on social media, listening to groups in public spaces, watching how people act in situations that apply to the problem, or how the media discusses issues around the problem. This is getting a little abstract. Let's use an example. Imagine we're looking to solve the problem of food waste going into the garbage instead of being composted. We'll start by asking our friends and neighbors what they do with their food waste, and if they care about the effects that it has when it's put in the trash. Some people will probably mention how it's just convenient to be able to throw food waste in the garbage. Some people respond that it's not a problem for them and they have a great individual system for their home. Others will mention that they would love to compost in their backyards, but it's too stinky. Others might say that they don't have space for composting because they live in apartments. Others might mention that they feel guilty for not composting. Digging through these comments, it's important to try to understand the true underlying problem that people have. People won't usually be able to express the true problem just an explanation for themselves, or a story that they tell themselves. In these conversations, empathizing with our potential customers, their situations, and their points of view will be important to actually understand their problems. The true problems won't be obvious in individual conversations, and it usually takes finding themes across conversations to begin understanding. When it comes to observing how people act, we could ask our potential customers if they could send us videos of them cooking so you can see what they do with the food waste. If possible, we could go into the locations where the people are working with food or leftovers to see what they actually do. Where's their focus? What is their default action? We might find that they don't have enough space where they put their garbage for a separate food waste bin. Or they might have a large dog that's always getting in their way and trying to steal a bite, so they rush and throw everything in the garbage. We can also look at social media and popular media portrayals of the problem. We could search for terms around composting on social media and see what complaints come up. While we're doing this, we can also see what people are doing as makeshift solutions or replacements, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. We can also see if these themes come up in sitcoms or other produced shows and movies, as they will often exaggerate real problems to use as conflicts for their stories. Coming back to ways that we can learn more about the problem, we can use surveys to learn more general information about the problem, and then interviews to go deep with specific people in our target market. It can also be helpful to look at combining or splitting the problems that you discover to see what the actual problem might be. In our food waste example, one of the problems was that people didn't like the smell. It might be that many people would be interested in composting if there was a method of reducing or dissipating the smell. If we combine that problem with the problem of people in apartments that don't have space, 
then it might be a logistics problem to find a separate place to do composting so that both the space complaint and the smell complaint are resolved. With this, we're starting to transition from seeing problems to understanding where opportunities might be. As we do that, we need to discover where is the value. When we're looking at the problems that people have, it's important to keep track of which problems people have spent money trying to solve. If they've paid for a previous attempt at a solution, then they're willing to pay for it to be solved. Another marker for problems that have opportunities is when people have spent time or effort on creating an alternative solution. People don't usually bother taking time to resolve a minor annoyance, but they will to solve a problem. If someone's made a makeshift solution, then others would likely appreciate a more complete solution. Finding problems that have a direct cost that could be avoided or that save time if they're resolved are also potential opportunities for an entrepreneur to provide a structured solution. Other problems that, if solved, improve an individual's quality of life or a business's product or service quality are also likely opportunities. And finally, broad societal problems and challenges are also opportunities for social enterprise solutions, but those require more creativity to make them financially viable. The first place to look to establish what the value of solving a problem is for a potential customer is to look at what existing solutions exist and how much it costs to get those solutions. Even if they're not the same solution that you would make to a problem, it gives a sense of the scale and the financial value being placed on the problem as a category. When I'm looking for the value that people and organizations assign to a problem, I try looking for the alternatives that people are using to prevent or partially solve a problem. If they're adjusting their operations or rearranging some methods for how they do something, then there's a greater chance that they would value a full solution. Asking your target market why they use replacements or alternatives can help you understand what part of their replacements they care about, what compromises might have been made, and what lingering problems exist, even with the replacements in place. You might even discover that the replacements they're using are solving a more important and valuable problem. If you can't find any comparisons to give a baseline for the value that customers would assign to the problem that you've discovered, then it can be helpful to try to identify what core human need is being solved for the potential customer. It could come down to something as simple as the customer wants to look good to their boss, or helping an individual solve their problem helps them to be closer to the person that they want to be. In essence, how would solving this problem make their life better, easier, or on the flip side, how would solving this problem avoid discomfort, pain, or costs? When we're digging to try to understand the core problems and how we might be able to solve them, there are several tools that can help us get closer to understanding. The first is jobs to be done theory, which is about looking at things from a product and service side and trying to understand the job that the customer is hiring the product or service to do. One of the main examples that Christensen references when he speaks about the theory is a situation where they were helping a developer of seniors' homes connect with their customers. Frequently, as potential buyers were looking at the spaces, they would ask, where am I going to put the kitchen table? The developer thought that this was a question about the layout of the rooms or about the square footage, but after some digging, Christensen discovered that the job hidden in the question was, where will my family gather and how will I stay connected with my family? This shift in focus from the complaint to the job to be done helped the developer adjust how they built and presented what they offered to address the true problem of staying connected to loved ones. If you can identify the job that the customers would hire to solve their problems, then you can have a better idea of how to package and sell the solution to the problem that you've been exploring. In our food waste example, it might be that people want to feel good about who they are and responsibly handling their food waste is a part of their self-definition. In this case, the job to be done is to take away the food waste and dispose of it in a way that matches their values. To take this further, we can do a value proposition map. This tool was developed by Strategizer with Osterwalder, Pinger, Bernarda, Smith, and the community that surrounds them. The idea of the value proposition map is to sketch out the desired gains and pains to be avoided and the jobs to be done according to the customer's own words. You can then map this against the gain creators and pain relievers that you can make 
and package those into products and services. If there's alignment between the gains that customers want and the gain creators that you can make, as well as the pains that customers want to avoid and the pain relievers that you can make, and then they're packaged in such a way that the customers understand and resonate with, then they'll be more easily able to express the value that that creates for them. As you explore the gains and the pains of the customer group, as well as the gain creators and pain relievers that you can reasonably produce, you might also find that the problems you've been focusing on can be subdivided into several smaller problems that each have their own small solutions. Those small solutions can also be packaged in different ways to make sure that you're valuing each solution appropriately for each customer group. If you've gotten this far, then there should be several problems with potential solutions. You might have also needed to revise the problem you thought you were solving and discovered a more accurate core problem that you should address. If you've ever had this happen to you, please share a story in the comments. This is one of my favorite parts of entrepreneurship, discovering problems that I can solve and figuring out both what people actually value and how to express it. But now we move on to another part of entrepreneurship, competition for the opportunity. In most cases, there will already be several solutions on the market for any one problem that needs to be solved. Sometimes the difficulty is in finding them. Other times, it's seeing that they're solving the same problem. Competition's not actually a bad thing. It often shows us that a method or a solution is viable and can give us a framework for solving it ourselves. It is especially helpful if we can see existing solutions in other geographies that aren't filling all the demand for solutions and those that are made for a different target market. In each of these cases, there are opportunities for modification and duplication. It means that we don't have as much work to explain what the solution is. It does, however, mean that we need to make sure that we aren't overstepping and violating any trade laws, such as patents or copyrights. In the case of a solution from a different geography, we could look at partnering with a provider from a different location to be the local provider of their solution. This could look like a franchise, a licensing agreement, reverse engineering their methods, or even sharing the business model, depending on the organization and their goals. When we're looking at solutions where the demand for the solution is just not entirely filled, there are often opportunities for a solution with a slightly different branding or positioning that can fill the gap. This is seen all the time with coffee shops, as there's variable demand in different neighborhoods and people groups, depending on the style and vibe of each shop. In each of these situations, there are many opportunities for solutions to exist side by side and to remain viable and the existing solutions provide a template for how others have packaged and sold the solutions. Finally, there are solutions that are made for different target markets. As alluded to in the previous example, there is variation in solutions for particular groups of people. A coffee shop made for hipsters will appeal to a different group than a coffee shop made for metalheads, which will feel different than a coffee shop made for busy families on the go. Each one has a particular group that it's serving, and they'll fit particular groups of people better than others. And this allows multiple solutions to exist without conflict. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to join a network of people focused on using business to solve big social problems, then you can join us on Twine. It's a micro social network specifically for people experimenting, innovating, and creating social impact businesses. And if you'd like help with developing as an entrepreneur, practitioner, or a manager, you can contact us at info at strategymadesimple.ca. We offer workshops, coaching, consulting, and online courses to help social impact businesses create more impact by running effective businesses. We specialize in business development and marketing, and we'd love to hear from you.